In this lecture, we're going to be talking about the multiple comparisons problem and also the different tools and techniques that are available to us in SBM to solve this problem. There are a number of learning objectives associated with this lecture and hopefully by the end of this talk, you will be able to understand what the multiple comparisons problem is, be familiar with some common approaches to solve this problem, but also be able to explain random field theory which is the method of choice to use in SBM in order to address this issue. SBM, or statistical parametric mapping, is the process by which we take unprocessed data, apply some pre-processing, then fit a general linear model, encoding some experimental contrasts that finally results in a statistical image that tells us whether or not a particular brain region was active. However, every time you do these analyses, you will always get a result. The question is, if a given result you have is significant, was this brain region really active or could this have happened just by chance? The reason we can get results by chance that are not real is because during these analyses, we're actually performing many different tests at every different point in the brain. So there can be tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of results that we get. And we need an objective way of demonstrating that our results are meaningful and they're not obtained by chance. Because unfortunately, when you do many, many tests, we actually increase the chance that we will get more um, false positive results by chance. By way of example, if we have an image that has 100,000 voxels and we choose a false positive rate of 0 0.05, then we would expect to get 5,000 false positive results. Now, this is clearly undesirable. And to correct this, we need to define a null hypothesis, not just for a single test, but for all of the tests we're performing, for all the 100,000 tests. Now, there's a little simulation example here at the bottom of the screen, which shows some random noise with some signal in the middle. And we've repeated this 10 times. Now, if you use an uncorrected p-value of, let's say, 0 0.1, yes, you can see that we've identified the correct signal in the middle, but you can also see these false positive results around the signal. So we really need to control these false positives so we don't think that all this random noise is in fact meaningful signal. One of the easiest ways to address this problem is to use a approach called Bonferroni correction. In this case, what we do is we take our desired error rate, let's say alpha of 0.05, and we then simply divide that alpha rate by the number of tests. So as an example, if we have five tests and want to achieve an alpha level of 0 0.05, we would divide our 0 0.05 by five and then get an alpha level of 0 0.01. We would then apply this alpha level to each test individually. And if one of those was significant, we would know we had then controlled the family-wise error rate a level of 0 0.05. Importantly, this correction, it doesn't require our statistical tests to be independent, but it can become very conservative and very stringent if they are not independent. Now, let's return to the simulation example we discussed earlier, now applying Bonferroni correction to this example. Let's say we want to have our family-wise error rate at 0.1, and we're going to now compare it to using an uncorrected p-value of 0.1. In the uncorrected case, we can clearly see the signal is identified. We can always see it in each of these results, but again, we're seeing all these false positives around the signal. If we then compare that to the corrected p-value using Bonferroni, we see now we see much less false positives and we do see some of the true positives inside the signal. You will also notice across these 10 replications, 
there is only one experiment in which case in which we get a false positive because again we set our false positive rate across experiments now to have a 0.1 chance however while this is great for controlling false positives to a desired rate you will notice we're missing a lot of the signal that there's much more signal that we can clearly see in the data but because we haven't accounted for the fact that there's a dependency in this data Bonferroni has been much too stringent and we've actually lost some of the useful signal so always with Bonferroni there's going to be this tension between um, getting all the meaningful signal while controlling false positives Okay, so that has been a very brief overview of the multiple comparisons problem and one very easy approach to try and solve it, i.e. Bonferroni correction. So if we summarize what we've talked about so far, typically we control one test and we set a threshold such that one in 20 tests we will get a false positive. But when we have many more experiments and many more statistical tests being conducted, we now need to set what's called a family-wise error rate so that only one in 20 experiments as opposed to one in 20 tests will we get a false positive. And in practice, we do this by setting a much more conservative threshold. But obviously, when we set this conservative threshold, there's a real risk that if there's some dependencies in the data, some spatial structure to the data, we will miss out on some interesting signal. Now, neuroimaging is actually a fantastic example of when we have data sets and statistical tests that have quite a lot of spatial structure. And if we look at some examples here, we have time series where we have a lot less uh, independent tests than we do have number of samples. That also translates when we are looking at sensor level topographies from MEG and EEG data, where we can see strong spatial structure on the scalp topography, but also in the time domain. Similarly, when we do source reconstruction, when we look at um, the whole volume of the brain, there's also going to be spatial structure in the volumetric analyses. And again, similarly, if we were to do source reconstruction on cortical surfaces, we would see spatial structure on the cortical surface. In all these cases, Bonferroni correction would be far too stringent because it doesn't account for all this spatial structure in the data. Broadly speaking, there are two different approaches you can do to try and address this problem. The first one is to use parametric methods, which essentially assume a distribution of the test statistics in this that have spatial structure. And the other option is to do non-parametric methods, which don't assume any distributions, but actually learn the distribution from the data and um, can make informed statistically reliable decisions without making any distributional assumptions. However, the downsides of non-parametric methods is they're often much more computationally intensive to compute, and technically, they're not as statistically powerful as parametric methods. In fact, there are theorems out there that demonstrate that parametric methods are always going to be statistically more powerful than non-parametric counterparts. Therefore, in SBM, we use a parametric method called random field theory. Now, a random field is simply an array of smoothly varying test statistics. An example is a slice through a t-statistic in a brain image. And random field theory can be broken down into one reasonably simple equation. Now, that equation itself is here on the right. And essentially, the left part tells us the number of peaks or number of active brain regions we will get for a given intrinsic volume, which is just the, essentially the volume of the search space that we are analyzing, using what's called a peak density or an Euler characteristic. And this essentially tells us the expected number of peaks in a given volume. So if we know the expected number of peaks in a given volume, and we know the volume, we can multiply these two together and then work out the number of peaks. And this work has been developed largely by Keith Worsley in the early 90s, and Carl Friston then who adapted it to brain imaging. 
but you can go back as far as the 70s to see statisticians um, studying this particular um, branch of topology and statistics, and that would be the work by Robert Adler and colleagues. Now, this talk of Euler characteristics and, and random field theory may seem a little bit abstract. So I've given you kind of a, a fun example to kind of make um, random field theory a bit more concrete, and that is counting the number of pigeons in a park. So as kind of a metaphor for our peak density, if we were to know the expected number of pigeons per meter squared, let's say in, in a park area, so you actually take a small subsection and measure the number of pigeons in a, in a given area, and then someone told you, well, the park is actually this size, this area. If you multiply, multiply those two numbers together, you would actually work out an approximation for what the number of pigeons in that park would be. But in our case, we're not looking at pigeons and we're not looking at you know, the area of parks. We're looking for the expected number of active brain regions in a given volume. And then we have our volume, which is our brain. And we multiply these two together, we'll actually get out the expected number of active brain regions by chance. So from now on, we're going to look at each of these terms independently. We're going to look at the peak density, which is metaphor is the number of pigeons per meter squared in our park. And then it's this row subscript D in the equation. The Euler characteristic density, or the peak density, depends only on two things. One, what kind of statistical image have you computed? Is it a t-stat? Is it an f-statistic? Is it a chi-squared statistic? But it also depends on the dimensionality of the test. Now, what I mean by dimensionality is um, if it's a time series, it's a one-dimensional test. If it's a analysis on a cortical surface, it has two dimensions. And if the analysis is on a whole brain volume, it's a three-dimensional test. On the right, I've shown an example of what it looks like when you cut through a t-statistical image at a given height, and this height is symbolized by this blue rectangle. And below it, we've got a binarization of that image, just saying, you know, if you're above that height, the image is white, and if you're below that height, the image is black. Now, the number of active regions in this image is, in fact, perfectly predicted by these other characteristic densities on the left, which essentially all they are is um, the derivative of the given distribution. So let's say a T stat or a Z statistic with respect to the height threshold. And you just keep taking those derivatives to get higher order and higher dimensional um, Euler characteristics. The one thing that is important to remember when using random field theory to generate p-values for analyzing brain imaging data is it does have some assumptions. The primary assumption is that the Euler characteristic density is only a good approximation for a p-value at high statistical thresholds. Now, why is that the case? Well, first of all, if we think about probability distributions, we imagine that high, at higher thresholds, blobs or areas of brain activity become rarer, and at lower thresholds, they become more common. However, if we look at the shape of the Euler characteristic densities, particularly at low thresholds, we see something that's a little bit strange. For instance, if we look at the 2D surface, the red line, all the characteristic density right here, we notice for some values, for some thresholds, it actually produces a negative result. And we can't have negative probability, so clearly these areas of negativity are, are certainly not valid as um, p-values. However, there are these areas where between, let's say, 0 and minus 1, and here between 0 and roughly minus 2 for the 3D volume, we can see apparently the probability of getting a blob or a brain region that's active increases, which again is somewhat counterintuitive when you think of probability distributions, where we would always assume that the probability of getting a brain region active decreases at higher thresholds. So basically, it means that random field theory and Euler characteristic densities can only be used as approximations for probability distributions 
in these sections where the probability of getting a brain region or getting a blob decreases as a function of the threshold. And importantly, we see that um, that turning point here, we can see in the green line, it happens about minus two, and at the red line of minus one, that point increases the more dimensions you have in your data, whether you're using a 1D or a 2D or a 3D volume. So you need to be aware of this assumption. However, very practically speaking, it's been shown in the past and via simulations that for, for most 3D volumes, that typically if your Z value or your T value an associated uh, p value is, is, is less than 0 0.01 or z greater than 3. Um, that typically is the region of which um, random field theory and Euler characteristic densities produce valid p values. Now that we have discussed what the Euler characteristic density is, it's now time to turn our attention to the second term in the, in the equation, the intrinsic volume or the R subscript D in the equation. In our pigeon continent analogy, this is the area of the park. The intrinsic volume, as measured by random field theory and in SPM, is also sometimes referred to in the literature as the number of resils in your data or the Lipschitz killing curvature. The only thing that's important to remember really is that if you come across any of these terms, they all mean the same thing. Now, on the right hand side of the screen, I've got an example of two different time series that have both different number of samples and different levels of smoothness. Um, the red line is got way fewer samples than the blue line, but has been smoothed less with a full width half maximum kernel equal to four. Whereas the blue line has many more samples, 200 samples, but it's been smoothed by a much greater kernel with a full width half maximum equal to 20. Now, what's interesting is that if you look at the intrinsic volume or the number of wrestles in both of these time series, it turns out they both actually have the same intrinsic volume. Because again, this intrinsic volume is capturing more than just the number of samples in the data, but the relationship between how smooth your data is relative to these number of samples. Practically, how this is measured in SPM is by looking at the rate of change of the residuals of your general linear model with respect to space. Now, why does this encode the smoothness of your data? Well, intuitively, if your rate of change of your data with respect to space is very slow, that means that your data is going to be very smooth because it's not changing very much with space. However, if your rate of change is very high with respect to space, that implies that you are the time series is changing very, very quickly. So that's how the intrinsic volume is measured. Now, one thing to keep in mind, which is quite important sometimes, is that random field theory was actually not developed really for discrete data. It was developed for continuous random fields. So inherently, it assumes that the data is much more smooth than your discretization of your data. So for instance, if you, if you have voxels of you know, two or three millimeters, it often assumes that you, your smoothness of your data is maybe three times larger than the um, voxel size. Now, even if this isn't the case, it's not the end of the world, because if your data isn't that smooth, that implies that there's actually a lot of independent spatial information in your data. You've actually got a lot of spatial resolution. And in these scenarios, Bonferroni actually becomes one of the better ways to correct your data for multiple comparisons. And inside SPM, it automatically checks which is more appropriate for your data. Is it Bonferroni or random field theory? And actually picks the best option when reporting your results. So even though there is this assumption in random field theory about how smooth it is relative to your data, if it turns out if your data isn't that smooth, a SPM will replace random field theory with Bonferroni correction as it will be more appropriate in these scenarios. To reinforce these ideas of what actually affects the intrinsic volume 
of some data. I've given some examples here of different types of data. As we go down, so the bottom row, we're adding more samples. So basically, the more samples you have, the more intrinsic volume you will have. However, as we go to the left, we're also applying more smoothing to our data, and this decreases the intrinsic volume of the data. So that we get in these situations where, in fact, we have scenarios, just like in the previous slide, where you can have a situation where you have a case with some data with many more samples than a case where you have many fewer samples, but they'll both have the same intrinsic volume because random field theory is able to capture the fact that in some of these scenarios, the rate of change is really slow with respect to space. Okay, so now we've looked at both the Euler characteristic density as well as intrinsic volume and how we measure it in SPM. So now, if we combine these two things, we should actually be able to work out the expected number of peaks in our data. So, in this example, we've got our two different time series that have um, different numbers of samples, but also different levels of smoothness. We can input this into our equation, and we get out as an example for the expected number of peaks above a certain threshold to be 2.9. And that threshold in this case shows indeed, if you look at both the red line and the blue line, we indeed get out approximately three peaks in both cases. So just showing you examples of even in again different time series, random field theory is perfectly able to predict the number of peaks above a certain statistical threshold. And the real beauty now of having this method, this random field theory that is very generic, we can apply it to so many different cases and so many different scenarios that emerge in brain imaging such as fMRI, VBM, MEG source reconstruction. We can look at sensor level topographies in space and also how they evolve in time, as well as different time frequency spectra, and also single channel 1D time series. Random field theory is flexible enough to adapt to all these different scenarios with very minimal assumptions. Throughout this lecture, we have focused primarily on statistical inference surrounding peaks so controlling the expected number of um, peaks in a given 2D surface or 3D image. But that isn't the only way to do statistical inference with random field theory. In the early uh, 90s and later on the 2000s, um, Carol Friston introduced different levels of inference that trade off sensitivity for specificity. So we can have more statistical power if we're willing to compromise a little bit on spatial resolution. The peak level test has the highest um, regional specificity, so the highest spatial resolution, but it has the lowest sensitivity because it requires us to use high thresholds. Whereas the cluster level test allows us to incorporate the fact that our peaks may actually have a spatial extent. And we will then be able to identify a peak as being surprising, not just because of its height, but also because of how big that region of activity might be. Now, obviously, the caveat comes with this is why we, this will obviously be more sensitive. We will lose regional specificity because we'll no longer be able to say where in a given region is active. We will just be able to say this region is active, this cluster is active. The to increase the power even further, you can do what's called a set level test, where it's not just about the size of the cluster, it's actually about the number of clusters of a given size above a threshold U. And this is the greatest sensitivity, but it actually has the worst uh, regional specificity. So this is the kind of test that might be interesting if you're looking at networks, but um, not appropriate if you really want to start localizing um, individual peaks. Now, it's very important to realize that some of these methods also come with kind of, I suppose, hidden assumptions that, again, you need to be very much aware of, because both 
the cluster level and the set level tests, because they use Euler characteristic densities to generate their p-values, they still have this high threshold assumption. And I've kind of shown this mathematically here on the right, where the top row, it tells us our expected number of voxels that will be active in a given brain region or in a given volume. Whereas the second row shows us the expected number of peaks. And then if we take one and divide it by the other, we can actually work out the expected size of a cluster. So if we know the number of brain regions and we know the number of voxels in that region, we'll be able to divide one by the other and work out the expected size. So obviously then if we see a region that has a size much bigger than that expectation, it would be surprising. And that's the, the foundation on which the, the cluster level test rests. However, because you can see it relies on the expected number of maxima, which we get from the random field theory, it also has a high threshold assumption. So you need to be very careful that when you're using the cluster level tests, that if you reduce that height threshold, you cannot reduce it below the level at which the Euler characteristic density is a valid p-value. So again, for safety levels, we often recommend that you only use a height threshold that's greater than p less than 0 0.001. And then, then in most cases, the cluster level test will be a valid form of statistical inference. The other way you can start to improve statistical power is to incorporate prior knowledge into your experiment. For example, if you know where or when something happens, so if you're interested in an auditory response, which you know happens in the auditory cortex at a particular time, say, let's say 100 milliseconds post stimulation, you can actually avoid the multiple comparisons problem completely and just look at that time point and um, that area and do one single test. And it's a very powerful, much more simple message. However, this can be a little tricky if you want to do random field theory across a subsection of a brain region, but not a single voxel. Because you can run into a, a kind of an interesting scenario where that again, we require our Euler characteristic to be sufficiently high that it becomes a valid p-value. But because the region you're interested in might be so small, it may turn out that Bonferroni is a much better option. And particularly, if you're going to do cluster level tests in smaller volumes, they may not get you the statistical power you think they will, because the expected size of the maxima isn't going to change as you work in smaller regions. And in smaller regions, the Euler characteristic may become less valid as a p-value. So in these cases, for smaller volumes, it may be worthwhile just using Bonferroni. So what are the kind of conclusions and then things we've talked about? Well, we've just talked about having actually strong prior hypotheses can reduce the multiple comparisons problem completely. And in some cases, when working in really small volumes, you may want to just stick with Bonferroni. But actually, if you're looking at whole brain results, random field theory becomes an incredibly powerful way to look at peaks and clusters and sets of results, and even in time series and time frequency domain in a very flexible and rigorous manner. And we're able then to control our family-wise error rate for any space of any dimension and shape. And if you want to you know, study more about random field theory, I've listed a number of kind of key references from you know, the very start to more recent papers, but all of them will give you a, a nice overview of how random field theory has developed now over the last uh, 30 years. So thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed the lecture.